Take your Bible, turn to Revelation 2. Lisa asked me this morning why I, I have like a dozen, I don't know, several white shirts. And she's bought me newer ones. She asked me why I like this one so much. And it's, I like it because it's thicker than the other ones. And it keeps my body warm while I have all this cold air blowing on me to keep my head cool. So my head's hot. I'm sweating. And I mean, I, I even Friday after we found out that we had been around COVID people, I'm going, I think I have a fever. Well, I didn't have a fever. It's just my face is hot. My head is hot all the time. So this shirt keeps me warmer than my other ones. It's thicker. So I like it. Uh, Revelation chapter 2. Good morning, D. Good to see you all this morning. Glad you're here. Revelation chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 18. Um, we're dealing with Jezebel and the typology of her, what God said about her, the reason why Jesus referred to this particular woman in the church as Jezebel. Uh, Revelation 2, verse 18, Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach, and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols and uh, so we started looking into Jezebel a few Sundays ago we found out she's named after Baal she she's the daughter of F Baal king of Zidonians she really is I believe Ahab's biggest downfall uh, I see Ahab as somebody doing wrong, but he's got a conscience about it. But Jezebel is right there all the time to make sure his conscience doesn't last too long. And I do believe, I do believe people can get to a point in their life where their conscience is seared with a hot iron. The Bible talks about that. And literally what I think that means is they get to a point where they are not savable. God God saw the condition of everybody before the flood. And God knew their hearts. God knew the condition that they were in. That all their thoughts, all their imaginations were only evil continually. And I want you to remember that word, imagination. Because that's going to be part of the message this morning. But um, all their imaginations were evil constantly. And they had reached a point of unsavability. And now, when God can't save you, that's messed up. But they had gotten themselves in that condition, and I think with a lot of help, from what was going on with the sons of God, the daughters of men, and the giants in those days. The Bible does not give us a lot of the details about the giants before the flood. But I think archaeology digs up evidence of the world that then was. And I think those giants had a very vast domain on this earth. I think they ruled this planet. And uh, I think they were a lot of the downfall. And what I've had to do is cut my, cut my thinking about the giants off from what I remember from reading the book of Enoch, I read the book of Enoch years ago, thought it was interesting, but the more I got into Enoch, I was thinking at first, you know, I know this is not in the Bible, but man, it's, you know, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. And the more I read Enoch, the weirder it got. And I went, this doesn't sound like the Bible at all. Doesn't sound like God at all. So I didn't read the rest of it. And when I started doing serious study on the giants, I had to cut off what I remembered from the book of Enoch because I don't trust it. Because I don't believe that Enoch wrote a book. Jude didn't actually say it was written by Enoch. He said Enoch said these words. 
And those words are actually in the book of Enoch. But I don't think they were preserved in that book. I think they were preserved by the Holy Spirit and God gave those to Jude. So anyway, I just don't trust the book of Enoch. You know how I feel about that. It's extra biblical and you just can't trust it. So anyway, back to, back to uh, Jezebel. I believe that she was one of these people that probably her conscience had been seared with a hot iron. Jesus gave her the space to repent. She was not going to repent. He gave her the time to do it. She didn't do it, obviously, and he cut her off. So anyway, uh, we talked about her prophets and so on. And then uh, we talked about Naboth and his vineyard and so on. And now I want to get to 2 Kings chapter 9. So turn there if you would, please. 2 Kings chapter 9. Verse 22. In fact, let's kind of get the gist of this conversation. Uh, let's see here. So I'm in first Kings, second Kings. Get it right, Mike. You pray for me this morning. Um, I don't want to tell you this. I don't want to tell you the story now. Um, but I lit, I got attacked spiritually in a way I don't think has ever happened before. And um, it's it's still has an effect on me right now. So I would ask you to lift me up if you want to have church today. Second uh, Kings chapter nine. Uh, let's go back to. We have Je we have Jehu coming, and in, let's pick it up in verse nineteen. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them. And said, Thus saith the king, is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. It sounds like Jesus saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. And he said, The watchman uh, told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of, driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. And Joram said, Make ready, and his chariot was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Ahazia, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. And they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And it came to ask, think about where they're at. They're in, the portion, they're, in, they're in Naboth's vineyard right now. Okay? They're in the portion of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? And I want you to think about what you know about witchcraft. Aside from the TV show Bewitched. But I will include the TV show Bewitched. Okay, you remember that, Jeff? Okay. I will include that show because... Um, there was a change in television shows. I did a study on this back several years ago. I have this theory that something in this world, a spiritual transformation took place in 1963. You have a lot of major events happening that year. Assassination of Kennedy, Supreme Court uh, disallowing prayer in public schools. Uh, according to Jesuit priest Malachi Martin, you have the enthronement ceremony of the fallen angel Lucifer taking place in the Vatican in a secret ceremony, 1963. You have that happening. And if you look at American culture before 63 and after 63, look at American TV shows. Before 1963, mainly family-oriented Father Knows Best, Ward Cleaver, uh, a, a lot of detective shows. The original Dragnet was on back then, and it was all about the good guys versus the bad guys. After 63, let me give you the top three shows during the 60s. Bewitched, The Addams Family, 
and the monsters. What, are those, what do all three of those have in common? They dealt with issues of the occult. Vampires, werewolves, Frankenstein's monster, witches, everything occult, the address. I think it's either the monsters or the Adams family. They live at 1313 something another. Uh, even um, Hogan's Heroes. What Stalag were they in? Do you remember? Stalag 13. Okay? Makes sense. So there was a changeover in television in the, after 1963. And the occult was being introduced because this was what was going on in California at that time. Uh, you had a lot of people turning away from mainstream Christianity or any form of organized Christianity or organized religion. You had a lot of people in California, even back before the 60s. Um, I can show you episodes of Perry Mason with Buddha statues dozens of times. And they make sure the Buddha statue is in the scene. Well, it turns out that the lady that played, what was the lady's name in Perry Mason? The secretary, Della Street. In real life, she is a Buddha worshiper. She's of the Baha'i faith, which is Eastern mysticism. She's into meditation. She's into the occult. She's talking to familiar spirits. She's doing all these things. Okay? That's, that's how she lived. And, and somebody who produced that show was a Buddhist because there are Buddhist statues. I watch Perry Mason every night. I like law stories and I like old TV shows. And I started noticing these Buddhist statues showing up. Well, that was going on in California in the 50s, probably even in, in the 40s. But it started coming out in the culture, in the mainstream culture, in the 60s, early 70s. And there was an explosion of new age. And anything new age is witchcraft. Anything new age is, is of the things that God strictly prohibited the children of Israel from doing in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Nine things he said don't do. And everybody in California was doing them. Okay? And then that started spreading. By 1980, I've got a book written by Marilyn Ferguson, who was a New Ager, hardcore New Ager. And she got a lot of criticism for writing this book, but it was called um, uh, something about the dawning of the age of Aquarius or something like that. Can't remember the title of the book, but I read it cover to cover. And she said, you know, I'm a New Ager, and she's teaching these New Age principles, and she said... Let me tell you something. We're everywhere. We're in halls of government. We're in the halls of the educational system, both in the universities, primary, secondary education. We are in businesses. We are in seminaries and churches and denominations. In other words, she was spilling the beans on where all the New Agers had planted themselves. And she said, you're not going to find a place in America where one of our people is not there. And this was set up, okay? So you have the introduction of witchcraft into the scene of American life. If you were to go to... Um, not too many bookstores left in places, but if you go to some of these big name bookstores and you go to the teen section and children's section of these bookstores, a vast majority of books written for children are based on themes of the occult, wizardry, witchcraft, Greek and Roman gods, Monsters of all types. I mean, when I was a kid, I read things like Superman and science fiction stuff. Kids nowadays, they're not reading science fiction. They're reading occult things. And when they're reading the Harry Potter books, that's old school. When they're reading the Harry Potter books, they are literally learning how to practice magic. I have a pastor friend that he's now gone on to be with the Lord. 
But he said a missionary recommended to him the first Harry Potter book. He said, have you read Harry Potter? And this pastor friend of mine, he was a youth pastor, and he said, no. He said, it's pretty cool. Yeah, read it. And he said, well, isn't that like, you know, wizardry? No, nah, no, nah, it's, it's, you know, it's whatever you make out of it. From a missionary saying this. And so my friend tells me, he said, so I went to the library. I got the first Harry Potter book. I read it cover to cover, closed it, and I wanted to be a wizard. And this is a grown adult man. He was older than me, in fact. And he said, I wanted to be a wizard. I wanted that kind of power as an adult reading this book. So that's the effect that witchcraft has had in our culture. And I can tell you, in third world countries, even in second world countries, first world countries, in some places in this world, it is a lot worse there than it is here. I think it's more veiled here, but it's still there and it's growing. The Bible says evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And that is exactly what we see happening. The spirit behind witchcraft, Nahum chapter 3 verse 4, because of the multitude of the whoredoms, of the well-favored harlot. Remember, Jezebel's a whore. Both physically and spiritually. And she's a witch. So, the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcraft. Look at what she does. She is a marketer she is a seller of goods, which is what God says about Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18. And who does she sell? She sells nations and she sells families through her witchcrafts, which means she loves to destroy families with witchcraft. There was a case this made national headlines, and I'm going to try to remember the story as best as I can. I have it in my notes. But it goes all the way back to probably 15, 18 years ago when I first started doing things on witchcraft. 17-year-old girl um, on trial. I don't remember what she was doing, but it was crimes related to her witchcraft. Crimes related to that. I don't remember what she did. Um, but she cast... I know one thing she did. She claimed that she cast a spell on a teacher that made her mad and the teacher actually got sick and almost died. Now, you can't bring that to a court of law. They'll, they, won't, they won't hear it. But that stuff actually happens. There was a case of two young ladies. Um... Uh, there are parts of the internet I just have never heard of. But there was a site that popped, popped up about 15 years ago called Creepy Pasta. Have you ever heard of it? You obviously have not been to Creepy Pasta in a while, have you? Okay. Well, it tells stories to adolescents about... I don't know, different ghosts, different occult things, different specters, you know, how to go into a dark room and say Bloody Mary 13 times and she'll appear, stuff like that. Well, somebody on Creepy Pasta started posting a, um, a story about a guy called Slender Man. Did you ever see the movie Phantasm? Anybody ever see that? That goes back a bit to the early 80s. Remember that movie, Gary? The, the long, tall guy who was the undertaker who could pick up a whole casket. You remember him? It sort of looks like it's based on his character in this movie Phantasm. And in Phantasm, they open up a portal where all these devils are coming out. Okay, That's what I remember of it. 
But according to the, the stuff that was being put on this creepypasta website, Slender Man, they would show all these pictures where Slender Man could be seen in the background. Now, probably a lot of this was Photoshop. But this 12, 13 year old girl convinced her friend who was a year or two younger than her that she had been talking to Slender Man, this creepy, long, tall, long armed, no face, black suit, white shirt, uh, geist. Slender Man had been telling her that she had to kill an enemy of hers to prove her worth to Slender Man. And those two girls went out and killed that girl. Cold blood. And I'm not, I don't remember this, I may not be remembering it right, but I think they were going to try this oldest girl as an adult. She was about 12 or 13 years old. But she swore that this spirit called Slender Man was communicating with her and telling her, to go kill this girl and she went actually went out and killed her okay we're not used to seeing that kind of stuff you know I still want to go back to father knows best and Ward Cleaver and okay um, although why Ward never whipped those two boys I never I never did understood that and they never got a whipping they were supposed to but they never got one but anyway um, Witchcraft has taken over, especially in the minds of our children or young people. The books in their li school libraries deal with the occult. They're teaching them alternative religions. They're teaching them meditation practices that come from Hinduism. They're teaching them all of these things. And Christianity, as Christianity is being tossed or deliberately removed by the Christians, evil keeps stepping in and filling in those places. And we have witchcraft all around us. Now, what exactly is witchcraft? Well, here's what God said about it. He's, Exodus 22, 18, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That's pretty serious. When God said, as part of his law, his civil law to the Israelites, this is how you're going to rule the Israelites. If you find a witch... She's to be killed, more than likely by stoning. Thou shalt not allow or suffer a witch to live. God said in Deuteronomy 18, this is part of the nine practices that God said, I do not want you doing. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Then he said, and I think these things are related, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. What is divination, do you think? When he says, someone that useth divination, what do you think that is? Huh? Okay. In other words, divining is a means of gaining information from the Spirit. So it would include... Cardomancy, where you're laying out cards, whether they're tarot cards or even playing cards. Or card captors. Or uh, Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Or any of these Japanese cards that you'll find. You'll find a whole section at Walmart of these occult card games. Don't let your kids play this stuff. Don't let your grandkids play. Play with it. Make your, make your children, your adult children angry by taking your grandkids' stuff away and burning it. Trust me. You might save their soul by doing that. I'm dead serious. I, let me tell you the meanest thing I ever did out trying to soul win for God. I was in Bryan, Texas. I had a summer internship there at a church down there and working with a guy who was a youth pastor great guy I loved him to death and he and I went out there was a family that started coming to this church and they went there for a while and all of a sudden they disappeared 
They had been coming for a while. So Pat, the, the youth pastor, Wes Bigelow, great big guy, says, let's go out and visit them, find out what's going on. So we went out to their house, called them at home on a Saturday and was talking to them. And they're not really given clear answers. But when we stood up to pray to leave, I stood up by, I stood in front of the television. I looked on top of their television and I noticed some literature on their television. And it was a TV guide. And I'm going, I've seen this before. So I backed up to the television like this as we're praying. And everybody bowed their heads. I grabbed the literature, stuffed it down the back of my pants. And we walked out of there. And we got in Wes's car and started driving off. And I went like this. And he said, what is that? I said, this was on their TV set. I looked at it. Sure enough, Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witness. I said, that's why they haven't been there. Because Jehovah's Witness has been there leaving their literature and having talks with them. Guarantee you that's what's happening. Sure enough, it was. And you know what? To this day, I have not felt guilty about stealing that stuff out of their house. Just telling you, maybe I was wrong. I don't know. But who knows? I could have saved them some, from something anyway. But um, divination is... A means of finding out something, information, through various means, like using cards. Astrology is a form of divination because you believe the alignment of the stars and the planets foretells what's going to happen to you that day or that year or that month. That's baloney. Uh, I've told this story. It's been a long time. I used to go home every day and in the Festus paper, it used to be called the Daily News Democrat, Every day they would print a horoscope in there. And when I was in school, I would come home and I would get the paper and I would look at my horoscope. I'm a Gemini. And I would look at that D and I would go, oh, that is amazing. That is what happened to me today. I didn't realize that the horoscope that was in that paper was for the next day. So I was making it up. But using horoscopes, using scrying as a method, whether you're gazing into a bowl of water, a bowl of mercury, or you're gazing into a mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of the wall, that's a, that's a form of scrying. Uh, crystal balls is a form of scrying. And what you're doing is that you're peering into, and the longer you peer into that, uh, the idea is, is that a spirit comes through that gazing material that you're looking at. They're gazing pools, gazing ponds, gazing wells. Watch out for that stuff. Don't go for that stuff, okay? I don't throw pennies in wishing wells anymore. I don't do it. That's divination. And divination is a means of finding out information through occult methods. Spirits are news agents. They are still messengers. They are still angels, evil angels, and some of their job is to deliver information to people. Believe it or not, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States spent hundreds of millions of dollars researching what they called remote viewing. And they had some guys that were pretty good at it that they used and they paid these guys well. The idea was that these guys were supposed to be psychics. One of them was a big time homosexual back in the 70s. And they're supposed to be psychics and the idea was we can't get an agent into the Soviet nuclear missile bases to find out what their launch codes are. We can't get a guy in there. So if we could have one of our psychics use whatever he's using to go inside of that and read what's on their panel, we can use that as a, for intelligence. And they did. Who remembers, and I heard this song come on the other day at the gas station. Who remembers the song, uh, what was it, Gary, Gary Paxton, Gary Parsons, uh, Dreamweaver from the 70s? Huh? Gary Wright. Gary Wright. That's who it was. I knew it was a Gary something. 
dream weaving is about astral projection. It's about the ability to leave your body and go any place that you literally wish to go to. And what I believe happens is spirits carry or transmit thoughts into your mind. I don't think they actually, I don't think their spirit leaves their body. I think the spirits transmit the thoughts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that this morning in the message. Um, and it's based upon something that happened this weekend to me. But um, that's what astral projection is. And according to those who practice it, you can go anywhere you want to. You can see whatever you want to, even to the farthest reaches of the universe. They can go literally wherever they feel like they want to go. So that's divination. Observer of times, that is astrology. An enchanter. What is an enchanter? Someone who chants. Do Catholic monks chant? And what do they do? Vain repetitions. Because they believe they will be heard by God for their much speaking. And Jesus said they're literally doing what the heathen do. And he said, don't do that. But that's what they're doing. Because they believe that by the repetition of their voices, whether they are speaking actual words or they're speaking mantras, which I've studied that a little bit to learn about what it is. One of the main mantras is called Om. And Om is a word in Hindu. And do you know what it means? No. It, it's a word that has zero definition. It is a word that literally means nothing. But according to the Hindu practitioners who use that mantra, they believe that by the repetition of Om, and even some of them are so gifted at this, that they can make their voice create two simultaneous tones at the same time in their chant. I've heard them do it. It's weird. My voice can only sing one note at a time. But these guys have a way of making literally their voice box produce two different tones at the same time. And what that is, it's the joining of like two opposites, heaven and earth and so on, or me joining with the spirit. And through enchanting, they get in contact with Shiva or they get in contact with Brahma. They get in contact with what they call God or their 330 million gods all at once or whatever. But that's what enchantment is or a witch. Now, a witch will use all of these things. A witch uses divination. A witch is a definite observer of times. Witches use enchantments. They use spells. They use witchcraft. Witchcraft, and I've said this, and I'm going to stand by it. There are two religions in the world. Born again Bible Christianity and witchcraft. And every religion in the world that is not Bible Christianity is a form of witchcraft. Because it requires the practition or performance or the speaking or utterance of enchantments or it requires the facing of certain directions at certain times of the day, at certain seasons of the year, using certain words, being in a certain place. They believe there are energy lines through the earth and you can get in these energy lines and literally connect to the spirits better in some places than you can the other. And I've said this before, the Catholic Church has a spot on the floor where the nave meets the transept and in that spot is where the dead body is, the casket is in a Catholic funeral. It is where the husband and wife receive the marital rites. It is where they receive the communion. It is where the partakers of the mass receive the communion. It has to be done on that spot in the floor. No other place. And if you don't believe me, just go online and watch Catholic masses. And you will see there's a spot there. It's the, it's the cross point. 
Does that sound familiar to you, the word cross point? Have you heard churches called cross point? Okay? I don't know if these pastors who have named their churches cross point or center point used to be a popular one. If they've ever done any research into what that phrase means, but it's not Christianity. It literally is a form of witchcraft. Say, witches will draw a circle and will put a pentagram in it, or in some cases, a cross. And they will stand in the exact center of that cross. The circle protects them from evil dragons that might not be in a good mood to deal with them. And there's whole things they must do to release the circle because if they walk out of the circle without releasing the circle, they could get, they could get destroyed by these spirits that they're trying to use to perform their witchcraft. They call it the universe, but the universe basically is these devils. These devils are the ones that are doing the deeds. And they're practicing Satan's religion itself. That's why God hates witchcraft so bad. Where is it, according to the Bible, that you can pray? Anywhere. Anywhere. Does God need you to be in this spot? Does God even need you to be in a church? No. How many people were not saved in a church? Okay. God was there, whether the church was or not. Micah chapter 5, verse 12. And I will cut off witchcrafts out of thine hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Now, I had to look that word up, because I didn't know what it I thought maybe I knew what it meant. I thought it was like in a form of enchantment. And maybe it is. But the word sooth is... The bell rang, right? The word sooth is an old English, old proto-Germanic... It goes back into that, and it literally means the truth. People who say the truth. The word Wicca itself is a derivative. The Wicca and wizard both are derivatives of the word wise and wisdom and wist. When Jesus said, wist ye not, I must be about my... He said, do you not know I must be about my father's business? That's what the word Wicca and wizard are, is based upon. It is certain knowledge that they have or soothsayers who say they speak certain truths that cause things to be. And I'm going to leave you with this part today. Beware of any kind of Christian ritualism. Beware of any kind of it. God is never invoked by a pre-formatted text of words that if they are spoken at a certain point and in a certain way, then God automatically must respond to that invocation. That is a lie. You know what it, it takes for God to help us? Help! Literally. Crying out. And I will tell you my experience with that this weekend. Okay? I dealt with that spirit Saturday morning. Let's go to prayer. Father, any time we deal with the devil... And expose his kingdom and his workings. Lord, I'm not surprised when all hell is unleashed. Father, I pray, dear God, for your help, for your guidance, for your mercy. Uh, Lord, help me to preach this message. I want it to be a blessing to people. I need it. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just make your people well informed of just how the spiritual realm works in our lives. And Lord, just teach us, give us wisdom, 
And Father, give us help from heaven today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, that would be your cue to say, Amen.